I am Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. I told you it's a currency war. I told you we're in World War III. I told you it's all about various countries attacking each other using financial derivatives. Bang, 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 bang. Look at this headline from the paper. Bundesbank chief compares bond buying to work of the devil. The work of the devil. The work of the devil, as I have told you on this show. Furthermore, let's go to China. Urge to launch attack on Japan's bond market right here right here in today's paper right now global currency war meanwhile over in san francisco the fed asked their facebook page question what effect do you think qe3 will have on the u.s economy some of the answers from the good citizens of america were weimar printer toner i'm a big bank i love it I went out to one of the Queen's castles and asked one of her beloved sheep what he thought of big baby Ben Bernanke's QE to infinity. What do you think he had to say? <coughs> Stacey Herbert, tell me more. <laughs> that sheep looks scared. You know, if that sheep saw this first headline, Max, he would also be scared. SEC charges New York Stock Exchange for improper distribution of market data. So this is the first ever fine against a stock exchange. And the SEC has charged New York Stock Exchange with compliance failures that gave certain customers an improper head start on trading information. And you can see from this little chart here, all the information flowed first to the proprietary trading not to the consolidated feeds, which are to the public. So Max, you uh, designed the software that is used on this New York Stock Exchange, or part of it is. What do you think? No, I designed the replacement software, the replacement technology, but that's been warehoused. They don't use it. It was meant to override this broker-dealer conflict on the floor of the stock exchange that uses the specialist system. They act both as a broker and as a dealer, meaning they maintain an inventory of stocks, and they're able to buy and sell in the open market to maintain that inventory and to satisfy market orders when they come in. You get a guaranteed execution when you put a market order into the exchange, but it gives a wiggle room to the specialist to trade on inside information, and that's allowed to foster liquidity. But what we see here, Stacey, is the New York Stock Exchange is selling the wiggle room to proprietary clients who are trading on inside information. So they've turned a flaw, they've turned what Alan Greenspan himself called a flaw in the specialist system, they've turned that into a profit center, and they're getting proprietary information to insiders to front run other customers, and it's a blatant wealth confiscation scheme by the New York Stock Exchange at the expense of the overall economy. They're draining the economy of wealth. They're causing austerity. That's what's fostering this currency war. That's why the devil's involved. <laughs> well, and of course, everybody tells you, you see across America and the media that, oh, all those Occupy Wall Street type people are just jealous of the wealthy. But this shows in no uncertain terms that since at least 2008, that's all the data that the SEC was managed, managed to gather, is that they were front running the public by quite a lot of time. Um, now, the New York Stock Exchange agreed to pay $5 million, but we'll go into this next headline, which gives further information from Bloomberg. New York Stock Exchange data violations extend U.S. exchanges' reputation woes. Uh, reputational woes are not a deterrent. Now, in China, when they find bankers committing similar crimes, they frickin' execute them, okay? That's a deterrent. That's a deterrent, my friend. And now we have, this is clear. Stacy, we've been talking about this for months. This is a clear evidence. This is ir ir irrefutable evidence of blatant fraud. Occupy Wall Street, they should surround the New York Stock Exchange and close in like a noose on everyone working there. So Sanjay Wada, the de deputy chief of SEC's market abuse unit, says the New York Stock Exchange chose ground shipping for sending market data to the consolidated feed, i.e. to the public, but used next day air for its paying customers. And the SEC, as I said, found this out, discovered this information only by accident because of the flash crash of May 6th, 2010, when they were forced to look at some of the data, that what happened that day. And what they found was that during the two five-minute periods, starting at 2.40 p.m. New York time, the average delays for quotes were 3.7 seconds and 5.3 seconds to the consolidated feeds, while average processing time for the two proprietary data feeds were less than two milliseconds and 16 milliseconds. So they saw the huge disparity between the data feed available to the 
the proprietary clients and those available for the general public. So th these are the free markets as these guys see it. And this is what they say, you know, the scooping out of wealth. The fact that these guys can trade on information within two milliseconds and that Joe Bag of Donuts in the public doesn't get it for 5.3 seconds, they could trade hundreds of times before you could possibly even enter the market. Well, that's what makes this debate between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney farcical, because one's talking about, oh, I believe in distribution. The other one says, no, I don't believe in distribution. I believe in a free market capitalist system. And yet none of them are talking about the fact that there is distribution going on between insiders distributing all the wealth to themselves. That's the number one problem. That's how America got out of the depression last time were banking reforms. It wasn't the Keynesian policy. It wasn't the devaluation of the dollar. It wasn't World War II. It was the Pecora Commission and reform. That's what got America out of the Depression. What's going to get the globe out of the Depression now? Reform. If the policymakers don't enact the reform, then it's up to the people to revolt. John Locke, 1790, revolt now or be enslaved forever. So the high frequency trading caused that flash crash, which helped the SEC find information that the New York Stock Exchange was feeding data to these proprietary customers first. Now, this is from this past week, disturbing liquidity chart. So Nanex, which produced this chart, said on September 13th, 2012, at 12.25 and 27 seconds, the December 2012 e-mini contract experienced an evaporation of liquidity at such an alarming rate that it produced one of the most disturbing charts on market stability we have ever seen, as you can see from that chart. I would like to ask the sheep what he thinks of that chart. <laughs> Right. Well, when, 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 when volume evaporates, like uh, as being described, it's because it's completely non-existent volume. It's a hologram of volume. It's algorithmically generated volume. It's not buyers and sellers in the market. This is, this is an, by the way, here's, here's the CNBC coverage of the same story. In other words, it's complete nonsensical idiocy coming out of the mouth of propagandists who are putting forward this idea that there is actual transactions going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for the benefit of the economy in general. It's only wealth confiscation, computer-driven, proprietary, nonsensical hologram trading. And Maria Bartiromo knows this, but she doesn't talk about it because she's a propagandist, because the entire network's a propagandist. Joe Bag of Donuts, Schlongo, Sh whatever his name is, he's an utter too. Well, what that chart shows as the as you see that huge startling dip, that's 80% of orders resting on the books vanishing. So Nanix says of this, this event tells us that either one firm controls 80% of this contract, or that algorithms have become dangerously susceptible to herd behavior and can be triggered to stampede in a heartbeat. Yeah, push a button and you can trigger the stampede because you can re adjust the uh, quantity of trades required to affect an uptick or a downtick. It's classic virtual specialist technology. You can simply adjust the parameters needed, the protocols, to create an uptick or a downtick, triggering the, the herd behavior. The herd can always be relied on to act in their worst interest. That's the basis of modern capitalistic thievery. And you can just flash a negative print on the tape and the herd comes swarming in because they're panic, they're fear. And it, uh, could, this is what Hank Paulson did in 2008, didn't he? To get his way for almost a trillion dollars of extortion money for Goldman Sachs. He went to Congress and said, see, we're gonna crash the market. Put a gun to Congress's head, threaten martial law, and j triggered the herd behavior. But these are algorithms, and most of the trading done on the New York Stock Exchange is with algorithms. However, they can trade in a fraction of a millisecond. So this is a sort of a herd behavior that could just evaporate, as they call this is a favorite word of this modern financial system, is evaporation of liquidity, evaporation of wealth, evaporation of client funds. Everything just evaporates magically. Well, you talk about the uh, algorithm. The algorithm is very simple. The amount of orders it takes to create a sufficient imbalance to generate an uptick or a downtick is adjusted. That's the algorithm. And you just push a button, and you can make it so that you 
it's a it's a it's a wash trade is what it is by to use the formal nomenclature it's a computer generated wash trader simultaneously buy and sell in the market to make the price go up or down the prices are discovered by the computers and then the market reacts it's not the other way around when adam smith was alive the market first went to the market buy and sell and the result was the price now it's the price first by the computers and then the market reacts it's the complete opposite of free market capitalism neither mitt or obama talk about it because first of all they're both of them when they they're both financially illiterate they're both dunderheads especially mitt who's just a, a you know private equity scam artist uh, but they have no idea how this is working so, Max, speaking of flash crashes, we had a big one on Monday. Oil plunges $5 in rapid high volume selling. So, at 1.52 Eastern Daylight Time on Monday, oil was trading at $115.20 a barrel. This is Brent crude. And it fell to $111.60 three minutes later. So, either global demand for oil fell off a cliff for four minutes on, one, on Monday, or there was an algorithm trading wildly because 10,000 lots of Brent traded in one minute during the drop, up from 152 lots just the minute before prices plummeted. Brent crashed through the 200-day moving average before beginning to recover. So what happens then when it p passes through the moving average, the 200-day moving average, and doesn't that trigger other actions? It triggers the sheep who go, bah, or sell. <laughs> Now, exactly what I'm saying. They, they target the price of 111. That's the price target. They hit the algorithm to get to that price target and to flood the exchange with as many orders as it takes to get to that target. Into the market come the stupid people who are panicked to buy and sell, the buyers or the sellers. Uh, but those people are being dragged by the nose and they're being confiscating their wealth because they're stupid. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe not. Well, John Gretzinger, energy risk manager, says, I've been doing this for 14 years, and that's the fastest move I've ever seen. I think it was too fast to be anything but high-frequency trading or other algos. We just don't know right now, but that's my gut feeling. Duh! Like, oh, my arm just got blown off. It might have been a bomb. I'm not sure. Good, John. Keep, keep using that noodle up there. You're, you'll figure it out eventually. All right, Stacey Herbert, thanks very much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. You know, all these market crimes have led to financial collapse, which in turn has led to currency wars. So stay tuned for the second half, and I'll be talking to Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars, about the dollar, the euro, and the gold standard. Stay right there. Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Did you know that the world is engulfed in the World War III of currency wars? That's right. We're in the third major currency war that started in 2007. You would know about this if you read this book, Currency Wars by Jim Rickards. It's not too late. Go out and get this book. We welcome to the show right now the author, Jim Rickards. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, Jim Rickards, we've got some major action in the currency wars. First of all, congratulations. You predicted the exact date that the Fed was going to announce QE3, and you also announced that it would be perpetual QE3. Congratulations on that. Uh, anything Thank more you. to add on the recent Fed announcement? Uh, no, I think uh, between the Jackson Hole speech um, and what the Fed actually said, the Federal Open Market Committee on September 13th, they've, they've kind of said it all. They've announced an initial tranche of mortgages that they intend to buy, but that's not the end of it. The point is, they'll just keep making announcements from time to time. So maybe three months will go by, they'll announce another 100 billion, another 100 billion. What you have to do is look down the road and envision a Fed balance sheet that has perhaps five trillion dollars of base money up from about three trillion today. That's sort of where we're heading. All right, World War Currency three that started in 2007. We've got four big players here. You've got Eurozone, you've got the dollar, you've got China, you've got the Japanese yen. You pointed out that when the euro got to a certain low level in the band, China, of course, does most of their trading with euro. Uh, this would be more of a trigger at that point for the euro to take an action to support the euro. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and you said that they would have that taken place first. And then afterward, the dollar and the Fed would make their announcements. Now, my question is, how could you be so accurate? Is it because you don't really take on board classical economic theory and you're looking at this from a, a completely different perspective, Jim Rickards? 
Uh, I think that's right, Max. The, uh, uh, I find that actually forecasting is easy if you get the model right. If you've got the wrong model, you'll never get it right. And most, I think, neo-Keynesians and uh, uh, the, the mainstream economics that we see at the Fed and the Fed staff, the Treasury, um, you know, the IMF and elsewhere, those models are completely flawed. They assume these Keynesian multipliers that are completely mythical. They assume things about velocity and money that are historically, empirically wrong. This is not just a matter of opinion. I think empirically, if you look at the time series of prices, you'll see that they're not normally distributed. They, they're in accordance with what's called a power law distribution. Well, that's not just a geeky argument about the shape of a, a curve in a degree distribution. The bell curve and the power law represent completely different dynamic systems. If you get the system right, which is hard, but if you get the system right, the forecasting is a lot easier. As far as the Chinese are concerned, the Chinese, you know, they don't want to be the suckers at the poker table. The United States put enormous pressure on China to allow the yuan to appreciate a little bit against the dollar, which it did in 2011. But the problem is they didn't want the yuan to be strong against the dollar and the euro. So once, you know, once the euro got weak and the yuan was stronger, the, the Chinese said, forget about this. We're going to lower the yuan. And they have. They've now repegged the dollar and actually lowered it a little bit. So that's also the essence of the currency wars, Max. It's not a one shot deal. It goes back and forth and back and forth. It's a lot like a ping, -pong, ping pong game. And these things can actually go on, as I've shown historically, for 10 or 15 years. They're not over in one or two years. It takes a long time for the, the, the countries just fight each other. Nobody wins. All you get is either global inflation or a contraction of world trade if the currency wars turn into trade wars. So you get bad outcomes either way. But they go back and forth until finally the system breaks down. The major countries come together and they reestablish the system. We're still some years away from that. These currency wars are going to continue. All right, I want to stick on this theme of the breakdown and failure of classical economic theory. Since 1971, the U.S. went off the gold standard, and you enter this era of a fiat currency world where the prices are all referential to other fiat currencies, and the amount of the derivatives that trade based on these fiat currencies has been exploding exponentially to the point where you don't really look at this from the point of view of economics. You look at it from the point of view of systems analysis, and when you look at it from that point of view, you have points of stress, points of chaos. Uh, in your book, you talk about uh, phase uh, states where an additional snowflake on the side of the mountain will cr create an avalanche. Are we right. pre-avalanche moment? Is the stress in the system with this new QE, it, has it increased, Jim Rickards? Well, we are in a, uh, a pre-avalanche uh, moment, Max. That's a good way to put it. I would say that with the breakdown of the gold standard in the 1970s, you know, Nixon suddenly went off gold in 1971 in one speech. That was the so-called Nixon shock. But the system kind of stumbled its way through the 70s. The world wasn't sure if they wanted to go back to fixed rates at a lower valuation for the dollar. Eventually, they decided on floating rates, and yet the European monetary system came together with a unified currency. So there was a lot of turmoil in the 1970s. Of course, what we got was borderline hyper inflation, quadrupling of oil prices, you know, three recessions back to back to back. It was a horrible period of economic performance. But beginning around 1980, 81 with Volcker and Reagan, what we saw was not a gold standard, but what I call the dollar standard or the king dollar policy. So it wasn't a really strong anchor, but it was some kind of anchor. And countries around the world could at least anchor their currencies to the dollar. And we saw that in China, uh, you know, throughout Southeast Asia and elsewhere. People were saying, okay, we trust the United States to maintain the value of the dollar, so we'll anchor to the dollar. That trust was misplaced. Beginning uh, really around 2010, uh, the United States decided as a matter of policy to trash the dollar. Uh, the Chinese made one enormous blunder. They actually trusted the United States to the tune of $3 trillion of assets to maintain the value of the dollar. But now the U.S. is cheapening the dollar. You know, if China has $3 trillion of dollar-denominated assets and you lower the dollar 10 percent, that's a $300 billion wealth transfer from China to the United States. China's learning the hard way that you can't really trust the United States anymore. All right, Jim, if China is losing trust in America and the U.S. dollar, and by uh, manifesting that loss of trust, they are buying gold, and gold right. prices are going higher, people are right. losing, li looking at gold, and they're, and they're saying, well, that's the proxy of the distrust of the dollar. China's aggressively moving. Let me ask you this, because you're so plugged into what's happening in Washington and Wall Street. You've got to be like the insider's insider. Is China going to make a surprise announcement that they have accumulated suddenly another one or 2,000 tons of gold that nobody is on anyone's radar? Do you have any inside information with us you can share with us in the global audience? 
Well, um, I think we can look at experience because they did this before. In 2009, China's official reserves were about approximately uh, 600 tons. They came out one day and said, you know what, we actually have an additional 500 tons. So they got a little over 1,000 tons, just short of 1,100 tons in total. Well, they didn't acquire that gold overnight. They acquired it over five years between 2004 and 2009. What was going on during that five-year period? Well, they were acquiring it through stealth, uh, secret means, secret agents, uh, various channels. And you can understand why because gold is thinly traded and they didn't want to have the market impact if the world knew what they were doing the price would have skyrocketed well there's absolutely no reason to believe in fact there's a lot of evidence that indicates that they're doing the same thing now we don't know exactly how much they have but china is the largest gold importer in the world they are the largest gold producer in the world their mines are producing 300 tons a year that is by far the largest in the world where are that 300 tons going some of it's going to domestic purchases, but a lot of it's going to the central bank. So this is an estimate. My estimate is that China's gold reserves are actually closer to 2,000 tons rather than the official 1,000 tons. And we should expect that shock announcement sometime in the next several years. The problem is their economy is half the size of the United States. The United States has 8,000 tons of gold. So just to look the U.S. in the eye, they actually need 4,000 tons. So maybe they've scratched and scraped their way from 1,000 to 2,000, but they need to get to 4,000. So they're still a bit of a gold pygmy. They're still far away from where they need to go. But this is just going to put upward, price, uh, upward pressure on gold prices for years to come. I mean, my estimate is it'll get to $7,000 an ounce. Not, not next year, or not immediately, but sooner than later. That's my target price for gold. It's a simple, uh, you know, division between paper money and gold. That's where you get to. Right, Jim. So uh, as you have you pointed out many times, when the ultimate shootout at the OK Corral of currency wars takes place, he who has the most gold uh, is going to be the victor. And China finally realizes this and they're massively accumulating gold as fast as they can. But I wanted to return to the Fed for a second because they've sure. done something that they've never done before, as far as I know. And this is an open-ended quantitative easing commitment month after month after month, 40 billion in uh, mortgage-backed securities, you know, quantitative easing to infinity. It, it sounds like a suicide mission. Your thoughts? Well, um, I think it is a suicide mission for the dollar, and it's, it's going to have very bad results for anyone who's trying to save or, you know, if you have a pension, an insurance policy or an annuity, uh, you know, your savings are going to be wiped out. Because what the Fed has really done, there's something a little more profound going on behind the scenes, Max, because they've said, you're, you're exactly right, they're going to print all it takes. This is uh, Bernanke's equivalent of what Draghi said. Draghi said, we're going to save the euro whatever it takes. Bernanke, as of September 13th, said the same thing about the dollar. He didn't use these exact words, but when he says open-ended, my interpretation is whatever it takes. Now, they're, they're going to print money until the employment situation in the U.S. improves, but they've thrown in the towel on inflation. What they've said is, look, there's some ideal mix of inflation and real growth, which together equals nominal growth. You know, they might want to see, say, 2% inflation, 3% real growth for 5% nominal growth. But if it takes 4% inflation, 1% real growth, they'll take it. In other words, they don't really care what the mix of inflation and real growth is. They're targeting nominal growth because we have nominal debt. And truly, the nominal GDP, the absolute number of dollars, regardless of the value, that's going to you know, get the velocity going, drive the economy forward, try to bring the unemployment rate down. But what happens is you're going to get more inflation and less real growth. So, you know, and, and Paul Krugman and others say, don't worry about inflation. Well, he's right to the extent we haven't had it so far, but look out, here it comes. The thing that people don't get about inflation, people focus so much on the money supply. Money supply is only a, a partial function of what produces inflation. The other part is velocity or the turnover of money. That's a psychological and behavioral phenomenon. It can turn on a dime. Right now, yeah, people would rather save and pay down debt and deleverage. But once the inflation genie is out of the bottle, they can start spending very quickly and inflation can take off. So it won't just go smoothly from two to three to four. It could jump to seven or eight or nine percent inflation very quickly. Yeah, I wanted to stick on that inflation idea for a second, but I want to actually more importantly get to uh, something that our audience at the Kaiser Report brings up every time you're on. Because we talk about the gold standard, talk about the inevitable return of the gold standard, and people ask, well, is there a downside to the gold standard? What's the wrong way to do a gold standard, Jim Rickards? The wrong way to do a gold standard is the way they did it in the 1920s, if you get the price wrong. In other words, every gold standard is some relationship between paper money and gold. There are a lot of questions you have to answer to get it right. People 
throw the word gold standard out there. They don't even know what they mean sometimes by gold standard. And the fact is there is not one gold standard. There are many different possible gold standards. So you have to answer a few questions. Number one, what's your definition of money? Is it M0, M1, M2? They're all very different. Number two, what's your percentage backing? The hard shell gold bugs say it's got to be 100% or nothing. Historically, that's not true. England ran a very successful gold standard with 20% backing in the 19th century. The U.S. until 1968 had 40% backing. So historically, you can have less than 100%. The final question is sort of who's in the club? If the U.S. were to do it alone, that would be extremely deflationary because we would have the only currency anybody wanted. All the other currencies would go to zero. Why would you want paper if you could have a gold-backed currency? That implies it's got to be a worldwide uh, agreement among the major trading partners. But if you do that and you bring in China, uh, you're going to be bringing in a lot of paper, not so much gold. That's going to dilute it. And that's going to cause a higher price. So when you take all these things into account, that's how I get to my, you know, kind of seven to ten thousand dollar estimates. But there's not a central bank in the world that wants a gold standard. My point is, they may have no choice. If there's a loss of confidence in paper money, and I think we are heading in that in that direction, they may have to go to a gold standard, not because they want to, but because they have to. But it, it really does require some study. I like to see it done thoughtfully rather than chaotically. All right, Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars. We're out of time. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.